Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is David Sinai, and I am the founder of Pixera. We are a retouching agency based in Miami, Florida. And we are kicking off a series of uh, videos with uh, prominent photographers. Uh, some of them are our clients uh, to help our customer base uh, hear from some of the finest photographers in the industry. Today, I'm gonna to be interviewing Leighton DaCosta of San Diego, California, who focuses on headshot portraits and boudoir photography. Uh, so welcome, Leighton. How you been? It's been it's been a long time. Hey, David. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, it's been it's been quite a quite a minute, right? We, you know, definitely a a long time. God, I can't. I think we met back in 2014 at uh, one of the events here in uh, Hollywood, Florida. It was the Professional Guild Association of Hollywood, and uh, I can't believe it's been eight years already. Wow. I know it, it's, it's been it's been a while. I was just looking at um. One of my first, uh, as a matter of fact, and it's in the it's in the, the reel. We'll get to later. One of my first pictures that I've had edited by Pixera. So it's like it's I'm like man, this is from a while ago to to now. So wow. it's uh, wow. it's pretty good to still be around at least. <laughs> so uh, so you know before we uh, get into you know what's keeping you busy with photography, why don't you give uh, give us an intro? You know, tell us a little bit about. Uh, when you got started in the business and what led you to photography and um, and then you can transition a little bit to what, what's happening now and and where your business is taking you these days uh, sure enough um, like everybody I, I shouldn't say like everybody but like a lot of photographers I do not have a formal quote unquote school education of photography I learned started learning it back in 1992 93 um doing high school yearbook and newspaper. And I was actually the business manager for my high school newspaper team, but I had to go take pictures for ads. I had to go take pictures for sports and I learned a lot of photojournalism. I learned a lot of portraiture and basic photography back then. And so from that point on that pretty much, and, and you know, I, I got into the photography side with at least with the yearbook and newspaper staff because all the cool kids and the very attractive kids were doing yearbooking and stuff like that. Um, fast forward about 10 years later, I was stationed, I got in the Navy, I was stationed in uh, Norfolk, Virginia, and photography was still a hobby, still taking pictures. A couple people ask you to do, you know, hey, take some pictures from me. Hey, then somebody magically asked you the question, how much would you charge to do this? And then from that point on, I've been learning, continuously learning, still learning. Uh, that was back probably 2003, 2005, and been learning ever since. Uh, I've done everything from pets, realized I didn't like that. Uh, I did children, realized I didn't like that. Uh, did maternity, liked it, but just didn't really get deep into that. Uh, for the most part, did weddings for a long time. I actually loved weddings. Um, it just got very, very orchestrative or big for me. I like smaller, more intimate weddings. Uh, I wish I had learned about outsourcing on the earlier on, um, even though I didn't know something, but I wish I had a confidence that might have got me there now. And what, because of moving around so many times, what I found has been my bread and butter has been headshots, portraits, and boudoir, because almost anywhere we went to in the past, I mean, I think in the past 10 years, I've lived in five different cities. And to be continuous, um, that mixed along with fashion. And I love fashion, I love fashion work. It is a competitive doggy dog world in there, but it is so rewarding on the creative side. And, and, I, and I tell even my newer photographers that the two things, especially when I'm, I'm helping to teach on wedding side, the two things I loved about fashion photography and sports photography is that they always kept your eyes moving for something else, for, for another shot, another frame. and it, it, it bolstered up your, your reflexes. And so between all of that, I, I enjoyed every single part of that. Now, today, like I said, I'm, I'm specializing in portraits, headshots, boudoir, and I do a little bit of commercial work on the side. The I have some new protégés who have gotten me into uh, 
And I kind of feel like uh, the Godfather, like, you know, once you try to get out, they keep dragging you back in. And so we are looking to do some weddings in the next couple of years. Amazing. Good. To, to do, to train both on the business side, especially on the business side, and then also on the capture side. Amazing. Well, you know, you've been in the industry now, I'd say 15, almost 20 years since you started. And, uh, you know, it's safe to say that you started photography just when the digital revolution was beginning. Um, so you probably had a little bit of experience with film and maybe you, you shoot some film, but you, you've kind of gone through gone through photography um, when technology was really sort of disrupting what was previously a pretty a pretty stable uh, profession for a lot of people but technology has definitely um, had its fair share of disruption in this industry and I'm curious to know what are your thoughts about being a photographer in 2022? Would you say that it's more challenging today than it was when you started? Um, are you seeing any new opportunities? I know you recently um, started using medium format uh, sensors. Uh, I think you're using Fuji. I think it's the 100S. So I didn't mean to like guide you to that answer, but I'm curious in terms of photography, in terms of technology, do you see it as a more competitive time to become a photographer? Do you see it as a better time because of new toys and, and things that make being a photographer easier? Just, just curious, you know, what, what advice you would have for somebody that's just trying to get into the industry now and what do you like about being a photographer in 2022? And what are some of the things about where we've been in the past that might make it, might introduce more opportunities for people? All that is, is, is really, really strong, really good questions. I will frame it with this way. So, you know, let's go back to 1992. 1992, we're, we're doing film, you know, um, 12, 24, 36 exposure roles. And, you had to be a lot more selective, you know, even when um, weddings were being shot mid 90s, 97, 98, you purchased a wedding pretty much by amount of rolls before you even started doing the wedding. So you're talking about, let's say 360 frames is what you're expected even on the proof side. And so, and that was, a, that's considered a lot. Fast forward to, like I said, 2004, 2005, digital, I, I would, I think the biggest thing I, I noticed between, and I even go that 20 year span between 92 to 2012, your skill, and this might get me banned by the other photographers around, your skill wasn't as important as your creativity and talent. The digital sensor allowed you to see something with your eyes that you had in your mind, take the shot, realize instantly that you got it wrong and improve the shot. Not only did it allow you to do that, it allowed a lot of photographers the ability to take hundreds of shots in the, the span where they would only take dozens. And we all know that 10, we always say the 10,000 shots, 10,000 hours of Malcolm Gladwell, 10,000 anything makes you better. And when you have shutters that are rated at 300,000, 400,000 exposure shutters, you're an expert. Like by the time you get that camera for your third wedding. So, you know, and I know guys that used to shoot 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 frames a wedding. In 2022, there's tons of opportunities, especially coming now out of um, the pandemic era. Uh, there's, there's three things I think that are benefiting photographers right now. The first thing is that there are people who are looking for photographers. They're looking to get out. They're looking to capture memories. They're looking at because they've lost a lot of people during that the, the past two years, or they've lost a lot of experiences in the past two years. So that is the first thing. Second thing, even on the wedding photography side, I think something in the neighborhood of that there's more weddings uh, planned and booked and scheduled for this year than in, in, in like I think in almost any other time in the past twenty or thirty years. Really, and, and that's really? a that's a huge thing. That was in the, the wedding market report. But lastly, the third thing is that clients are willing 
and able to pay more now in 2022 than they were even in 2019. They are more expected. So while there is a still the, the, the $50, $25, $10 headshot type places out there, there is a, a huge market for that $500, $1,500 range headshot, that $3,000 portrait session, that, that $10,000 family portrait print type thing. And, and I think that is more common now. And I don't say that it's, everybody's doing it. I'm saying that that's more common now than I think even five years ago. On the, the negative side, and I, and, I, and I probably should start negative, but you know, on the negative side, the bad news, so to speak, I think 2022 offers more opportunities for burnout for a newer photographer. And the reason why I say that is because the stresses went back when you had film and you had to learn from somebody and somebody else would teach you. You learned a lot of techniques, you learned a lot of secrets, but you learned a lot of business along the way. And most newer photographers are only learning income, expenses, and outflows and stuff like that. They're not learning efficiencies. They're not learning how to scale their photography business. It, 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 it's, in, it's interesting that in-person sales, IPS, is the big buzzword for the past two or three years, right? And it's like those that have been around for longer than 15 years, that's what it all was. It, it, like, it was always IPS. It was never a shoot to burn, you know? So. It is, it's funny how we get to now where everybody's trying to get out in this space, Instagram, social media, um, they're trying to get their images out, they're trying to get pictures out, they're trying to beat algorithms, right? We're all trying to do content creation. And I think the stress of being popular is weighing down a lot of photographers, it's causing a lot of mental issues, it's causing a lot of things, it's just, just things that normally wouldn't be present for that photographer. Normally you could take your, your own crappy pictures and 5% of the population would, would love your, your work and your images and that would get you through. Now you can take phenomenal pictures and just because you got 13 likes on a social media platform, that makes you want to hang up your camera. So I think that's the number one um, hindrance now for photographers starting now is the, the the social media aspect of creating burnout. They're gonna to do too much, too soon, too fast. And by the time they realize where the inefficiencies lie. Well, let's, can, let's I'm, gonna, I'm gonna dive a little deeper on that. Cause that, cause you hit on a, on a really important topic and you, you, you're basically hitting on, on marketing and how, to, and how to get more business, right? That's, that's why we use social media, that's why we're posting. If, you're cons if, if the point is that having to create a lot of content, having to you know, post all the time and deal with not seeing huge amounts of response is a concern, what are some effective ways of staying in the marketing game that you find are more productive uses of time if social media is potentially a way of psyching you out or, or disincentivizing you? Do you? Have you found another alternative that works better that keeps you going and doesn't psych you out or... or, or, or you know, so for me, burn you out. Excuse me. For me, low hanging fruit has always been the, the, the ticket, right? When I moved down to South Florida, the first thing I did, I joined the guild. I joined the photography. I, I got around other photographers. It was being in North Florida that I realized the value of the guild. But just joining the guild doesn't make mean that you're going to get clients. But you're around other photographers who are in the same business and we are in this aspect now where we do have a lot more competition or or what is it called uh camaraderie or or you know community over competition there's still competition but there's a lot of community over competition right uh you know being out in south florida there's a i'm not gonna mention their name but there's a studio that's over 100 years old and they're very competitive but talking to the guys they're very very responsive they, you know when they have time. When I moved to Tampa, that's the first time I actually joined the Chamber of Commerce. 
And what I learned from the Chamber of Commerce, and I think that was my best experience, which prepared me for moving out to San Diego. The Chamber, you get out what you put in. And I think even with social media and a lot, what we want, we want to do something one time and we want an instant response. Um, when I did the Chamber, I actually did, I think three or four events from covering them and everything like that. And then after that three or four events, then there were certain individual clients that started reaching out to me. And these were pretty, pretty good clients. And they reached out to me to do their shoots, do their headshots and stuff. Um, you know, so, go ahead, sorry. Would it be safe to say that going back to pre-social media ways of, you know, getting the word out there and marketing and networking are what work for you? Chamber of I, Commerce, um, you know, I, I would say yes. It, it, not, not, and understand this. We need social media. My, my last client um, is a newspaper reporter, or she's a TV news reporter, and she just went to uh, North, Northern California, used my images for her press release, did a headshot session for her. She found me through Instagram and Facebook. We were in a, a community forum in Instagram and Facebook. Um, I think the, the, the portion that I really want to stress home is the C word, community. And so we talk about social media and a lot of us business people, especially when we're solopreneurs, we want just to do something and plant something, but we don't, we don't water, we don't fertilize it. So why I say this is that whether we're using social media as our primary thing, we, we need to build a community. We need to build some kind of interaction. And I think what ends up happening is that what has worked for me that personal touch, that, that, that ability to say, hey, to pick up the phone or call or email or using a CRM that, that has almost instant contact after somebody reaches out to you or even when, you, when, you, uh, when you're bad, when you're busy because everything's going on, you know, you just say that, hey, we can text message, we can do this, we can do that. And just asking questions. I think that in this day and age, what more people want it's they see your images they know that they're okay they're good enough right no matter how you could be Andy Lee was you, you, you're good enough so then the next thing they're going to look at is well how much are you in charge and based on your presentation the person themselves will say hey I can afford or I can't afford even before they ask you how much do you charge but the third thing is do they like you or do they and I actually even say like you do they affiliate with you can are you somebody they're like hey i trust their work or i trust their ability to do work or at least their ability to get the job done yeah. um the the you know <laughs> a good example um so there's a guy and there's a there's an awesome amazing guy in south florida and i happen to shoot the bot mistress for his daughters right and so it's amazing amazing experience amazing experience right and and I, try, and I appreciate his confidence in me. When I was in South Carolina, where South Carolina is the, is, is the South, it's not, you know what I mean? It's the South, right? Come to learn that there's one of the oldest, um, I guess, congregations. I don't, I don't know of, uh, right? Jewish congregations in South Carolina. Did another bar mitzvah up in South Carolina. It was a great experience. It was something to learn, something different. And that was because of affiliation. They, they, they found me through somebody else who said, oh, hey, I know a guy. Is that word of mouth? Yes, it's word of mouth, but it's not just a regular word of mouth. It's community word of mouth. It's people seeing you helping other people, helping other, you know, like I did a photographer's branding uh, photos in LA. She, she had me go out to LA. LA has tons of photographers, much better than me, right? But they have tons of photographers. But it was that trust level. And what's so funny is that, um, I hired her for as an, as an assistant. And the first, I've known her for like five or six years through social media. But the first time I met her was when I hired her as an assistant back in uh, 2020 to shoot, uh, or 2021, to shoot actually a Miami model who was out there in LA. And, you know, eight months later, I'm shooting her, uh, um, her Brandon, her Brandon phot photographs, where, which were also uh, edited by Pixar, by the way. Amazing. But, uh, <laughs> Amazing. Wow. So, so yeah. bottom line, um, 
the challenges are, are social media, you know, it, it, it can be a real hindrance. It, it can psych you out because everyone's on there and everyone's competing for the clicks and, and for, for, for the likes, um, you know, but, uh, but just if you, if you remember some old fundamental concepts of marketing on how to network, on how to get out into the community, on how to uh, network with the right people. Uh, you don't have to. You don't have to just rely on social media, and 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 you can still be successful. Just going back to good old, you know, fundamentals. It, it's a toolbox. Um, Skip Cohen, right? And this is this is a true story. So Skip, I don't know if you know who Skip Cohen is. He used to be, I think, either president or vice president of Hasselblad USA. Okay. Because he, you know, has Skip you right and. If you're a photographer and you're on LinkedIn, follow him and he is very responsive. And so back in 2014 or 2015, um, no poop there I was in the middle of Afghanistan. And we're having a phone conversation and there's actually Howitz is going off in the background. He's like, where are you at? And I'm like, I'm in Afghanistan. And we're talking business. And one simple thing that he told me to do on my website was put contact information on my website and an actual phone number or an address contact information on my website don't just have a contact form and, and i was like man you know i don't want people to call me he's like get another phone right which is mostly voicemail because i never answer it but get another phone just for that now why is that so big for me um when i was in, in charleston had another client who their assistant called me like two days before her, her conference. And the main reason why I got the gig wasn't because I was so amazing, it was because the best ability is availability. I answered the phone, I was there. And, exactly. And she didn't want to go through forms, contact forms on the website. And so that goes back to saying, like, I mean, that goes back to the yellow pages. You know, back in the days, you know, if you were in the yellow pages, you were legit, right? So it is it, now, all these are tool, tools in the toolboxes and you try to do the things you can do consistently. I'm bad on blogging. I know I need to do blog more. And I'm surprised when, when Google says like three people visited, right. You know, and I think it's my best friend and my wife that came to my website, but the, um, that being said, it, it, there are certain consistent fundamentals because we all try to trace going viral. We all want to go viral. Um, and it's something that uh, is attributed to 50 cent. When he, the, when he said, create a catalog, because you never know what exactly would go viral that you produce, even whether it's social media, whether it's YouTube, whether it's whatever it is. But if you create a catalog, you have one image that goes viral, and now somebody wants to see your entire catalog. You, you have a gallery show. You have a collection. And I think the intent, and that's where I, I've always tried to get back to, to answer another question. So I'm going to segue into an answer to your another question is as I go back and start building collections of my work, right? Um, you know, to, to produce a book, because, you know, there, there's a, a proverb, you've probably heard it before that, you know, a man needs to do three things, plant a tree, have a son, write a book, right? Yeah. And right now I'm working on my book. I'm working on that collection, that thing that's gonna outlive me. And when I did this, I've worked with Micro Four Thirds. I've worked with APS-C. I mean, I had a Sony NEX6. That was one of my first mirrorless cameras, right? Loved it. I think I still have it somewhere sitting around here in a box. Um, I've worked, I'm mostly Nikon. Uh, most people know me, I'm a Nikon MPS professional. So you, you asked me a question about switching and I'm like, I have not switched, I've augmented, right? Mm -hmm. So um, the, uh, because neither one of them is paying me to be, you know, faithful. So therefore, I'll, uh, you know, I hang out with the Fuji on some days, and I hang out with the, uh, the Nikon on others. But that being said, when I decided that I'm going to start printing more, and I think that changed a lot of what I wanted to do. I wanted to print more, include prints with collections, give certain things. But I also know that hey, headshots, digitals, they make money. Those are bread and butter, Monday, what I call Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursdays. But the prints were what I really looked at. And going to the technology now, especially with mirrorless, if I was a new photographer 
starting out, you know, and not out of school, just a, just a regular person who loves photography starting out, and their intent is to be professional, not, not an amateur hobbyist. Mirrorless is the way to go right now. There's some good cameras like the D780, which is exceptional and everything like that, but really, mirrorless is the, is the way to go. And the reason why mirrorless is the way to go, because in the meantime, until you can build up your skill, it helps polish your talent. And I think that was one of the things that digital has helped a lot of photographers. I mean, and, and no slight to him, but like photographers like Joey L, who like in three year span went from nobody even knowing him to internationally known. And that is because you have a vision, your eye, which is most important than anything else. And then you have the tool. And just being a master of the tool, and, and I'm the I'm the four I'm the four wheel drive guy. I have a saying that I tell my students, it's not about the gear until it's about the gear. Like I, like I have a four wheel drive truck. I probably have only ever needed to put in four wheel drive low, maybe three times in the past hundred thousand miles. But every time that I put in four wheel drive low, I've been glad that I had four wheel drive low. And so when I say that for professional gear, do most photographers need a camera with two slots in it? No. But the one time that you don't have a camera with two slots in it, you wish you had it. So when it comes to gear, it's like, if you're planning on taking somebody's money, get the best gear that you can afford, right? Don't buy the best gear, get the best gear that you can afford. And that may be a balance between getting something like a, um, an Olympus and three or four really good lenses for less than three grand. That may be something to where you go to a Sony and there's a, or, or Sony, Nikon or Canon and have tons of used lenses and an adapter and everything that you can get in. It, it, it's what can make you go to another level. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things Just that- Just for clarification. Sorry. You meant you said that mirrorless is the way to go, especially if you're just starting out. And you didn't say it, but I'm going to maybe try to read between the lines and try to connect the dots for some people that that may be wondering why you you're saying that. I think I think the reason is because with mirrorless. What you see is what you get, whereas with a DSLR camera you're still looking through an optical viewfinder and you're not looking at an LCD that's showing you exactly how the image is going to come out. Is that, is that, is it, that it's along point? those lines too, but the, 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 the best camera we have, this is another cliche. The best camera we have is the one that you have with you, right? Best camera is the one that you have with you. We all have this camera right here. And this is a, what you see is what you get. And 99% of the people who are out there shooting right now have one of these. And we always joke as photographers, yeah, I got $15,000 worth of equipment, but here I am with my iPhone, right? It's because the IQ that's out there. So starting off, I think most photographers, almost all photographers has a vision of what they picture the image to look like. And, and we're starting off, and we all know this from, you know, back when we shoot with our old Minolta's and AE1's and stuff like that, that, you shot it, you knew what you shot, you had your shutter speed right, you were looking at your meter and everything else. But when you actually exposed and developed it, it was maybe a little bit underexposed or a lot underexposed, or it was really, really blown out and you can't get that moment back. So with somebody starting out as they're growing, the tool that they have available to them right now, and little side segue, 20 years ago, I used to play golf at school, or 30 years ago, I used to play golf in high school. We didn't have game improvement clubs. Now I'm starting back golf again. And they got these game improvement clubs that reduce right. flex on the front. Why is that so important? Because I know I want where I want it to go. And that doesn't mean I'm gonna get it in the hole, but it just means that it's not gonna go all the way in the bushes and the grass. Well, the same thing with mirrorless. Mirrorless says that, hey, the exposure is right. This is right. Hey, you know what? If I know how to do custom white balance, as I learned that, exp what I see is what I get. And is this good enough to at least get me to the next level? Um, the, the ability to create photographs is not 
the same as the ability to be creative. And I think that's why I said that their talent. Now, I know tons of photographers who are highly talented, who do not use off camera flash. I know tons of photographers who are like renowned, you know, wedding photographers who cannot go into a studio, right? And, and use a pro photo head. Just like I know a lot of studio guys who can't go out and go shoot a wedding. That's not their bread and butter. That being said, the ability to have mirrorless right now, I believe, puts the access in more people's hands, allows you to get better, allows you to see, hey, you know what? What I see is what I get. If I, if I got it, you know, if I add light on one way before I even uh, click the shutter, now I can see what, what it is I'm looking for. And that's it's incredible. incredible. That, I mean, that's it, it truly is amazing. Um, I, I think that, you know, the technology and the tools that we have at our disposal nowadays, you know, make, make photography so much more interesting than it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago. To think about how, I mean, I love film and I love the artistic look that you can get. And, but man, it's so much more easier today to, to, to know what you're going to get before, you know, you take the film to the lab and then you have to wait. And yeah, I mean, there's still that cool element of surprise that film gets you. And, it, and there's something really cool about that feeling of seeing like, I, mean, I, got film in, I got film in the fridge and the freezer right now for the same reason, right? Because, and, and, and we know that as film ages, it changes. Yep. So, you know, and then even when you expose that film, when you actually get it developed, that changes everything, the time, and, you know, but I think also, so my favorite camera that I have right now, ironically, or I should say my favorite, the one I love to shoot, right? Which I don't shoot as much as I do often is my Nikon DF. I have a Nikon DF. I had it when it first came out. So that camera is almost 10 years old right now. And it seems like it's so long ago. And why I love that camera, besides the, all the knobs, and that's on all the, I think Fuji has knobs on top and everything, was because that camera had, at the time, hundred. it had a D4 sensor. It had 100,000 to, I think, 400,000 ISO gain, whatever you want to call it these days. But what I, and it's a DSLR, right? And it had, it gave you confidence. It gave me confidence that, hey, I can go into a dark room. You know, I might not be able to focus because you had to know how to use the focus on it, but I can go in a dark room and I know I'm going to expose something even if I put it in auto ISO because I'm shooting mostly black and white with it anyway, right? So I'm not really compared, like noise, I'm like, ah, oh, I got that. But to me, the most perfect camera on the market right now is a camera that costs more than my my Fuji, which is the Nikon Z9. And the main reason why I said the Nikon Z9 is, is because of the autofocus that's on it, plus the dual feed. That's technology that is that you would not have even imagined 10 years ago. And we complain about it as photographers. We're like, like, hey, the Z9 is out. So, you know, this this D850 isn't isn't worth anything anymore, and it's like no, that's not true. What do you so, mean by the dual? Just for for those of us that are, aren't familiar with that technology. What... So, to my understanding, to my knowledge, and somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but on the sensor, the Nikon, there is a there is an output to the uh, the electronic viewfinder, and there's an output to the actual uh, to the card or you know to the processor. And so when you're actually going, one of the things that with digital is that you, there's a little bit of blackout. There's a little bit of, it doesn't do that. Not only doesn't do that, the AF is so on point that because it isn't doing any of that, it is tracking it the whole entire time. And it is probably one of the most advanced eye track that's out there right now. Um, they had plenty of time to do it because they were like the last one to come on the market with the eye track, but that's beside the point. Um, but Right now, Nikon is keeping it, is choosing to keep that technology in its flagship camera. And that is a $5,500 camera, which a lot of people complain about. But in reality, it's, yeah, in reality, that's like $500 or $1,000 cheaper than what the camera that it replaced when it came out. And so cameras are getting cheaper. Fuji has now brought in uh, $3,000, gets you into a medium format. 10 years well, uh, ago. You're talking about the. Um... 
the R, right? The, well, the fifty uh, R and I think now the fifty S two is for the right. You need a four, three or four thousand dollars. But the but but the reality though is that, you know, when in two thousand fourteen, I went down to I think I think two thousand fourteen to fifteen. I went down to uh, the Leica store uh, down there in in uh, the Gables. And they're like, hey, walk around and take this camera out, right? And here you got thirty or forty thousand dollars in your hand between the camera and the lens, and you're like, man, how can you justify this on a business side, right? As a regular quote unquote portrait photographer, because even if you're you're netting a thousand dollars per shoot for camera gear, not talking about your profit or anything else. That's what you're renting your camera gear out to yourself is $1,000 a shoot. That's 40 shoots that you would have had to do to justify that camera. And I know there was leasing things and there's, there's kind of, you know, there's fuzzy math that goes on there. But when Fuji turned around and said, here, here's a $10,000 camera, here's the, the 100. And oh, by the way, here's, a, here's one that's a little bit less, right? Now Hasselblad says, okay, well, you got two cameras. Hasselblad has three cameras right now in the market for less than $10,000. Wow. Which which is, so medium format, and I think Fuji does, has done it right. I think Fuji has done it right because they said, hey, we're gonna do big frames and we're gonna do smaller frames. We're not gonna go into full frame space. We're gonna let those guys fight it out. And because they choose to go into smaller frames, it's hard to find any, I think Nikon only has three APS-C sensor, uh, sensor cameras. I think Canon only has two or maybe three. And, um, I don't know what Pentax is doing, a Rico Pentax, because I know that they re-released, but the ones that are really hurt is Olympus, right? Because Olympus is now, which I think is the best sealed cameras out there, and they have some great tech. But when you're looking at the price and everything like that, there's a very, they get more and more niche. And I think why a photographer starting up now has so many, so much tools at their access. And we're not even talking about, so uh, here's some stupid, like if I was shooting weddings still more, here's a stupid thing that I have. So I have a software, right? That does color, right? And what I used to do was because I'm cheap. So I admit that is that I would have to call just before I sent images down to you guys down there because I didn't want to pay for 5,000 image call, right? And so you have a software now that costs 100, 120 bucks or whatever it is a year that it doesn't get it right. No, it doesn't get it all right. There's not a human interface right there, right? There's not an aesthetic value. But if it gets me from 3,000 to 13,000. You have a, the aftershoot product? See, I, I, I didn't want to mention it by name, but yes, the aftershoot product, a product, right? It is good on certain things, but like what I found, like for fashion, it's not the best because it will classify if you have a, a model that's looking like this. And then looking like this, it'll classify it as a duplicate. Whereas that's what exactly what you wanted. You wanted those few shots. And so, but the thing about it is, is that for somebody that's getting in, there, you know, we've always had ever since computers out there, we've always had all these softwares that's supposed to make our jobs easy, right? But the reality is, is that they're tools, and I think that photographers now, the and when I saw now the seasoned photographers, the the five to 15 year photographers have gone through all the, the gimmicks. And because one month, um, when I was on the, the Nerdy Photographer podcast, he asked me like, what's the worst camera or photography related product that you've ever bought, right? Or, and I was like the arsenal, because I have an arsenal, right? And, and I can't say it's never worked. It's never lived up to the hype. It, like it just never was like, it, it just took too long for what it was doing. And, yeah. and, I, and I say this because this is a, somebody who had, hey, Gary, I had a, a Gary Fong, uh, the, the, you know, all the other stuff, right? So if it's been in photography, I've probably touched it at one point. And I've had some great products, some great things. And, and, and it's just a balance of knowing who to use. We did, I did a blog um, when I talked about different retouches a while back. I'm thinking about did it four or five years ago. And it's like, 
there are certain things I have that, that I'll do myself because I can do it really quick. There are certain things that, hey, you know what? They become a little bit more time sensitive. Um, and then there's certain things that, yeah, I can send it over here, but it's a one-off thing and, and, and then the price comes up. But then I got stuff that, you know, I send to my guy that's in Portugal that, you know, I know I'm gonna hurt because the price is in euros. So it's like, you know, the, uh, there's a different thing, but you have to know when to do which. Sure. And so, so I think with the gear now, um, like I said, I love the medium format. Like, like the, 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 the Fuji impresses me every time I, I use it, right? Amazing. Like when it doesn't do what it's supposed to do, the so, only thing I can blame is me, <laughs> right? Of course. Um, so they, been, what I oh, wanted sorry. to do is spend a little bit of time just um, talking a little bit about, you know, your career, how it's evolved. And what I thought we could do is, is uh, show, show everybody some, some of your work that you're, you're proud of. And, and maybe if you could tell us about, you know, what makes these shoots memorable to you. Um, I'm going to give you access so you can share your screen. And if you want to, you know, introduce us to some of your clients or some, 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 some projects you worked on, tell us if they're, you know, what, what the challenge was, if there was one, or maybe it was just a really friendly client, whatever it is. Uh, let me, let me go ahead and uh, make you the presenter. All right. And I am, cause I am waiting for, uh, um, they should, some of these should have downloaded it already but okay. i am going to make sure they download as we go through okay and i'm going to share my full screen so um that way that makes it a little bit easier so let me make sure i got i clear off some of my uh, my clutter so to speak um uh, one last thing uh let's see all right so i am going to share i'll share screen uh, well, actually, I will share. This is why I re always wish I had my dual screen, <laughs> right? Because when I have my dual screen, it's just a little bit easier to uh, share one screen over the other. So I'm going to go through, you probably could see this. As a matter of fact, you know what? I probably share this direct. Hold on a second. Let me do this because I will share this direct. And you should be looking at an image of a young lady that is uh, by the phone booth, right? Yep. And so I'll talk about this. This was, we did this during, she is a photographer, as a matter of fact, and an artist out of South Florida. Uh, we did this last I'm year. just curious, what year was this taken because of the phone booth? Last year. This was taken during WPPI uh, back in um, August. We went up to Nelson's Ghost Town and they, it's a pretty cool area to go out and shoot. And so me and a bunch of photographers, we went up there and um, because it's hard to find a phone booth, <laughs> I was like, hey, let's shoot this. I've actually shot this with um, a pro photo. Uh, I was using uh, my D810 to shoot okay. this. And, and so um, this is for the most part, these are, uh, oh, you're killing me. This is another one. Some of these may skip a little bit because it's waiting for it to download. And you know, these were good. This is wow, well. this that's is, awesome. We shot this last year as well. Um, this was the young lady from Miami. She's a, a great, great model. And most of these that I'm going to show are going to be some are soaked or straight out of camera, some are, have been edited. So just to show it a little different, we shot this in Charleston back in 2017. Um, the thing that I liked about this was that. I was showing uh, one of my proteges at the time, Gino Porter, um, the difference of, of the background lighting and gel, because I think a lot of people, uh, a lot of photographers are intimidated by gels. And this is the same set. The only thing that's changed is we used uh, the gels on that. This was shot, this is a little bit more of a, a boudoir theme. We shot this down in South Florida out, out there in, uh, Weston, or not Weston, the ranches. Um, and the whole thing was like to add a contrast. You got a, like a lot of things going on in the back, but you're, you have the focus of the beauty and the softness in the front. 
this was a headshot. This was one of my, my most recent headshots. This is the, the young lady who uh, just went to um, the San Francisco market. And one of the things, this is a, I want to say this is actually a, two, a regular two light setup. This is a, a two light setup um, done with a back, regular black drop. Very similar to uh, when we shot a video years ago. Uh, yeah, I remember. Uh, yeah. At your place, right? So very similar setup. Uh, having um, an eyeliner. One thing I liked about this, and this goes back to a gear thing, and I try not to be too gear heavy, but for off-camera lighting, modifiers are so important. And if I'm talking to a new photographer, I would advise a new photographer to get something that is easy to transport. So while I love five foot banks, five foot banks are usually really hard to get to get around. Um, so this is done with a three foot bank and a 28 inch bank that um, from both from SMDV because they have really good uh, collapsibles and they are a little bit more robust than what you would find from the Autorama variant or whatnot. Uh, but that was pretty good. This one was done down in Tampa. This was done uh, beginning of last year. Um, to, to she's uh, someone that's relatively shorter, but we tried to find a feel. Excuse me, anywhere around. And this is one that was done a couple months ago. This is actually shot with the Fuji. That's the reason why I tell people there's little differences and nuances until you print something. But when when I'm looking at this, there was. What I was amazed about it was just how close, how, you know, when you start pixel peeping, that 100% view from my Nikon images, from my 77, you know, megapixel images versus 100% view from a 200, you know, megabyte image, it, it is totally different. Um, I guess it stopped screen sharing on me. No. But I'll, I'll, I'll bring something else up. Hold on a second. Because I want to see. Get to these right now. No, you're still the host. Yeah, you're still. All right, I'll I'll screen share back again. Let's see. All right. So this was from this year, and this was this year loved, being WPPI or this was actually right before WPPI, and so I love fashion. Trust trust me, I love fashion. I love brand and I love commercial work, and it is great to work with a brand that you love. So most people who know me and see me and watch me, they know that I always have usually a Gorin hat on, right? And you got, I got my hat wall, and this is not even close to anything that I actually have. And I mean, I got fedoras up top, but you can't really see them. And I even got to bought me a Gorin cowboy hat. So if you see me around, you know, with a cowboy hat, it's a Gorin too. Um, but Gorin, Boutique Fashion Week, Pretty Fly Society, they got together and had a fashion week out in Vegas the week before WPPI. So I got there early. And, you know, I collaborated with them on Sunday to do a shootout here in the desert. So that that lighting looks like natural light. Is it is it not? Or So yes and no. There is natural light and there's a pro photo as well actually used inside of it. Um, for the most part, uh, I'm usually mostly using the pro photo. Um, sometimes I will use my flash points. So, you know, for, for speed lights, like this right here, I, I loved this shot. This was just something, this was just supposed to be cool and peaceful and, um, uh, and the things, I don't know if it shows up well on the screen, but because, you know, the black jeans paint, like there's so many different, and plus it's dark skin tone. I was amazed by how the dynamic range of, that medium format sensor. So this is where I notice the difference. I don't really notice the difference when when there's great light, like like this right here. I'll notice the difference between the full frame and the medium format, like in the shadows, like it, underneath her arm, like like that's where I would notice it. But I usually notice that more when I'm printing. I won't. I don't really notice it on the screen. Gotcha. But when a shot like this, I noticed that I was like, wow. I was just impressed by how much detail, because that was something that used to, used to get muddied in um, other images. You know, this is also, and all these are shot with the, the Fuji, um, the sharpness, the crispness, the, like, 
the single strands of hair that you don't realize like, wow, they're that fine. Um, just different things. And it was a great, it was a great experience. Like, this is from their fashion week. I set up backstage to get everybody coming off stage in their outfits. Yep. And the business wise, the main reason why I did that was one, to be able to, to make connections with the models, the designers, the, the people in production. And these are relatively simple, clean images that can do with one or two lights and a backdrop. And I don't have to worry about them coming down the, um, the stage, right? Um, at WPPI, we shot this and here's another thing. This is his hat. And he loved the fact that I had a Gorin. And so um, when we were shooting, he, you know, we had his Gorin hat on and everything. It was just really cool to uh, to work with. We bonded over that. And this was one of the models out there. Prior, mil prior Air Force uh, guy that would talk to him. And he was wearing this uh, because of the designer that he knows personally. So then afterwards, she reached out to me about, and so that's that's how those connections get, you know, get made. Community, yeah. You know, so this was, and I'm like I say, it was it was just good shots. Like this is blown out, but it's not as blown out as it would have been if, if that makes any sense. Like like just a, and it was a look that I wanted. I knew that going into it. Uh, for uh, those who um, this was during the fashion week. Uh, those who know, I think it's Mary Cotton, uh, it, it, rocker band, whatever, right? This is during the fashion week, working work with them. And uh, Revolver Studios, they have worked with uh, Ozark for uh, Netflix. This was during the fashion week. Um, let me go back to, and that's Ben Gorin. I got this, the same cowboy hat that he has. That's the cowboy hat I done bought. So nice. this was a great experience, a great event that, I would never have been able to get, and this is what I love about the photography community and, 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 and photography in general. It puts you in places like that you normally would never, ever end up. Um, there is an affiliation. I say affiliation. I don't like name. There's an affiliation. And those of you that know Ken Griffey Jr., right? He retired a while ago. and But his kids went to college. When he was, the kids were going to college, he was shooting on the sidelines right. on a plane. And he was shooting with Nikon. And I told him, I said, hey, I can give him an MPS guy. But you know, it's, it's like little things like that. Yeah. Uh, this image I'm about to post up. Hopefully, I can share it back to you. And I'm going to because I know that it won't go. You may you may or may not remember this image. But this image was one of the first images. This was I shot this in 2013, so I think I got I sent it out in 2014, right? And this was one of the first images, and I really enjoyed it from. Um, uh, Pixar to edit it for me. So I, I, I really like that. Um, let me say, I'm going to send another one in the same desert, trying to be different. And very few people have seen these right here, trying to be different, doing a little bit of fashion, doing a little bit, but it's something different. Roller skates. Is that desert. WPPI this year? Same, same shoot. The, no, this is a totally different. This is during WPPI, but this, so this is Aiden. And I love Aiden because Aiden, um, I had a casting call back in 2019. Yeah, 2019. And we shot with Aiden uh, in downtown Vegas. And he goes back and forth between Vegas and Atlanta. Um, he does acting and everything else. And when we were shooting with him, I said, like, hey, would you like to come out and, and shoot with us out in the desert? So it was me. Uh, um, photographer, two photographers out of uh, Vegas or out of San Diego, which is ironic because both of them are Navy people. And I've met him three times in person, all at WPPI, even though we live down the street from each other. So it's, it's, it's the schedules never ever mix. Um, are you are you letting that from the go back to that last one? So is the light coming from his right side? So the main is coming from his from his right. That's the sunlight. Yeah. yeah. And then the fill is coming in from his left. Gotcha. Wow, that's sun. Wow. Oh, yeah. That, that Vegas, that, that desert sun, it, 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 it's, it's great. Like, this is the same thing. He's actually being lit from his, his backside and the close side is all fill. And that is actually flash fill. That's not even bounce because I didn't have it. It's too windy out there. 
most times they're not to actually have any kind of large um, screen. This was so, like during the shoot. Now, this is keep in mind, this goes back to my wedding photography days, right? Do a product, do a product shoot, do something that you know, hey, if, if this company wants to see it and say like, hey, how much is it to license that image, right? You know, well, I tell you what, I can license the image, we can do a shoot. You know, if you're gonna do spec work, so to speak, and I know that that's uh, one of those things in the, the community, like some people are for it, some people are against it, but if you're gonna do spec work, at least do it something that you would want it anyway, that you wanna sure. do. You still tell part of the story because this is the actual um, series for this. This was the first shot. Then we gave them these are awesome these are really awesome these are all and done with your your medium format this is done in the medium format and like i said it, it, this is a different look and most of this is done with the fuji profiles are you shooting it. with the one with the 100 or the 250 the 100s no 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 the the lens what, what which oh one? oh so i'm shooting with the 80 um, the 80 the 80 i i i i I want a 110. I really want a 110 because I hear it's really fast, really fo fast focusing. I just picked up the 35 to 70. I will, I'm waiting for the 20 to 35, but I'm probably going to get a 23 because I, I want something wider before I start going narrow because of what I'm shooting. I'm shooting more portraits, landscapes on that side with that, 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 um, that body. Yeah. Um, normally with the, the Nikon, um, 90% of my shots of portraits are done with the 105 uh, above all the other lenses, even above my 70 to 200. I just love using that 105. It's just lighter and easy to move around. And, and that's kind of where when we were talk, talking about the story, it's like you're out here, you're in the sun and everything like that. Um, sun's beating down on you. you now, you're, now you're cool. You got, you got your hat on. And at this point, what kind of hat is it? Yes, it's a Gorn, right? And that's kind of something, you know, where we were sitting there just having something about. Um, one last, let me see. This is another bread and butter where I'm going to show you because this is, so this gentleman right here, this is another headshot, so totally different. And it is, it's kind of funny because with this, he is, and this is the, the straight out of camera. The reason why I know this is the straight out of camera because in the background, I can see the line that's in the backdrop. So I can, see, I can look at it and see that. Um, but he's a former uh, executive officer, Navy executive officer for one of the battleships, right? And he's a civilian now and whatnot. And so things that I experiment with and I like doing in my headshots, little secret, right? I will use uh, gels on my kickers and stuff like that to, to add warmth or to add character, to add composition. And this is this one is a little hot, right, for me. Um, I would like just a little bit less. But what I found is that when somebody is two things, they don't have to have a big smile, but they have to be charming, if that makes any sense. I, I, that's the, the biggest thing, but they have to have confidence. I shoot from a certain angle when I do headshots. I, I want you, I want the eye engagement, and this is not to be like a, a Peter Hurley or anything like that, but I want the eye engagement to be where you feel looking at the shot that you're looking, that y'all looking at each other. Right. And, and I think that with a lot of us, and, and he felt goofy because a lot of us, when we deal with like round face people like myself, we usually shoot at a, a certain angle to, to remove this stuff. But the thing about it is, I think that when we do that, we lose our eye contact as much as it's not as right. powerful as it was. And I think I think this was it was pretty strong. He loved this shot. Um, I love it's great. It's amazing. Another Fuji shot. So this one is a little bit enhanced, right? So this is one of my most recent shots with the Fuji, right? So, and the color tone was because this is done in Palm Springs, and. If you've ever been to Palm Springs, there is a, for whatever reason, they're, they're, everything is white and pastels. And so it, it's a different sky, different lighting. Can different you go everything. back to that last one? Yeah. This one? Yeah, right there. Did you shoot that with a, a Fuji film simulation? Yes. 
or did you create that effect in Lightroom? So after the both. So I, I shoot mostly with negative, um, with negative standard, right? Most Pro negative standard. Yes, but every once in a while I throw Chrome in there, right? Um, sometimes if I'm in Lightroom, I'll do a bleach bypass, but it depends. But like with this, I usually do. There's another uh, preset that I actually have that. It, it 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 adds something to it that I, and it's just something that I like just gives it uh it, to me it fits yeah right. it's it's great it's it's great I love it, it's doing something to the greens and and the blues and and for those architecture people that uh like the buildings falling backwards or whatever it's it's yeah, I mean it was me or having her like doing like Michael Jackson and I think that was a great balance of that I, I don't um, even think that's offensive. <laughs> It's, it's fine. Same thing with this. Like, like we were over here. Um, she's being this. Now, this was a technique thing. And this was me also showing her, as well as a model, what she could do with this. And part of it was the light is coming from her right, obviously, from behind her right. But using the white wall, and this is actually a double bounce because the sun is actually behind this wall. So I'm using the sunlight bouncing off of the white building across the street to fit, to create that main light on her right hand side, and then using the wall on the left, her left, to actually fill her in. So are you? Is there any artificial light? There's no artificial light in this, and there's no. That's all straight uh, uh, balanced light. Pretty cool, man. That's pretty cool. The the her right cheek or job or up here that that looks like you had some you know some light hitting her man that's the sun coming right in yeah that's the sun like i said the sun the sun is actually right behind so we were fortunate at that time of day that and because the buildings across the street were also white to be able to come in um where i live at like like my office buildings every time i go to those office buildings it's double mirrored buildings so they just bounce light back off so it gives a surreal light um, nice out of there. Uh, finding this, this was one of those things to where, you know, you're walking down the road and you you, you find just something cool, you know. Um, and it was a good color. I love contrast. how I love how the 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 VW van has the same stripes as the um, as the rooftop. Yeah, right. it's, 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 something, it's a cool contrast, cool shot. And so it's like little things like that. Um, That's a great, great shot. That's an awesome shot. The, uh, but here's a shot and hopefully, let me see if I can get these out. But this is a shot that I actually, so what I'm showing you right now, excuse the language, but this is a, a photojournalistic shot. So was in Taiwan last year, right? This was the only graffiti that I saw in this part of Taiwan. And it was interesting because I don't believe it's the same person that did, this, did it twice. I believe it was two actually different people that did it. So that's why I thought it was interesting. But what I also found, oh, by the way, this was taken with the DF. And um, when I was in Taiwan, I, I just liked using that camera walking around. This was also taken with the DF, uh, doing a little bit of nighttime photography. There's a little haze because I'm looking through. Where is a that? Window. That's also Taiwan. That's all. Yeah, this is also Taiwan. Cool. There's a little haze looking through a window, and I think there's one more. And this is the 101, um, also taken with the DF. It, 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 it's wish we had more distance. Is just where we were at. We we hit the quarantine. And so it's like, well, when we start looking at certain things, you just got to find certain angles. It was raining. What's so impressive about this, a lot of people don't know. After a certain time, most days, especially when it's raining, you cannot see all 101 floors of this building. There's usually clouds right around like the, the 40th or the 70th floor and up. And so to be able to see all the, the entire building is actually a, a feat for those that have gone over there. That's this awesome. used to be the this is the second tallest building in the world. Used to be the tallest, but like the Burj Khalifa, like it's almost like seven hundred feet taller than than this. It's like stupid. 
Um, but let me go into something else a little bit different, if I can pull these up. So, like I said, I like to use gels. And the main reason why I like to use gels because it adds, you know, it adds a little, um, it adds a little pop and pizzazz or something that's just that you would normally see. So, especially when I do boudoirs, I love using some kind of gel, some kind of light, and whatnot. And we were fortunate because of where this room was, and I give a wider a wider view, right? Of where this room was, the light balance was good. The the gel her skin it just brought out her skin tones that much, and it just adds more to where. What is it, a gel? Like a purple gel? Uh, uh, fire and ice, a blue and a um, red gel with orange behind the red. Like it actually stacked up, so there's a little bit of a reddish orange. Um, I like doing fire and ice. I, that's just something I just like doing because it just adds a little different element. So, and especially with boudoirs, I like that. Um, especially with dark skin uh, uh, subjects, to me, the the purple, the blue, the indigo type gels work really well to enhance the depth of the skin, right? And this was one of these things, I don't know if it shows me zooming in on your screen. Does it Does show me zooming in a little I bit? See, I see plenty of like orangey color on her skin, which looks good. Right. So when I zoom in on like um, on the screen, you can see like even on her left side versus the skin on her right side, they're both really, really well balanced. I, I, th I, I thought I did a, a fairly decent job. Um, I'll, I'll show one more um, boudoir. Uh, let me see if I can find it. Uh, hold on a second. This was uh, an image, and you've seen this one. So this one, and this is this is an edited version of this, right? So. But this was shooting behind, putting a speed light inside of a shower, shooting behind the glass. And this is actually done with gels and color. So this actually, the color for this, I believe, is red, all right? So red and yellow. So it actually has a very, um, even the color version of this is actually uh, pretty, pretty profound. Um, but one last, thing, let me, so, and, and now we go back to the questions. This image I'm going to show is not a matter about how great the image is. It's one of my comebacks for why I love doing photography so much. What, what prevents the burnout? This young lady um, is the daughter of a model I shot 10 years ago. Oh, wow. Uh, and her mom just passed. Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, it was a tragedy. But her mom just passed last year. And, and so she moved out here um, to San Diego with uh, her, her aunt who me and her aunt grew up, you know, so it's it kind of close. But what I was always impressed by is that when I'm shooting her the whole time, I just saw so much similarities of her mom. And it was kind of one of those things where you know, it, it came full circle. Like just, just you know, like one, I've been around long enough to where I shot somebody and their daughter, <laughs> right? And and the two, it, it's just that, you know, it, it's something that we do that is so permanent. And that's why I said the prints do really, really matter so much. Um, I know I said that was gonna be my last one. Yeah, these but, are great. But here's, a, here's one that I did this in Jamaica and this is body paint. This is all no strobes. This is all constant lighted, right? Constant black lighted, uh, because I didn't have like the, the freaking sixteen hundred dollar attachment put on the pro photo. But this is all <laughs> all constant lighted. And when you say constant lighting, meaning just natural light? Like no, no, no. LED panels. Um, oh, 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 oh. Actually, yeah. Uh, not even LED panels. This is this is low tech because I didn't want to bring a lot of. Uh, equipment with me to Jamaica. Uh, I, I don't like to bring a lot of expensive stuff. And even though this equipment is still in Jamaica, right? It's one of those things where if it stays there and I never see it again, it's not a lot, but if it stays there and I can use it over and over again while I'm there, that's even uh, more amazing. 
But it took about six hours to prepare for this shoot. The body painter alone, like the body painter, she is absolutely amazing. Um, she goes by the name of Rue, R-O-U-X. Absolutely amazing. And we did a lot, but a lot of what you see, the, the dust and the clouds that's inside there, we used holy powder or holly powder, whatever they use. And we were throwing that around, around the back and everything. And so it was just a, a lot of the images from that shoot was just really, really. That is really beautiful. With That's amazing. So um, let me see something real quick. Doesn't even look like a photograph. It looks like a painting. Now, th here's the boring stuff. This is the stuff that, uh, like all those are cool, but this is the nine to five. So this was like when I was talking about being part of the uh, doing ribbon cuttings, right? That you're going to do ribbon cuttings. You meet new businesses that are in your chamber of commerce. You meet new people. And, you know, this is one of those things to where, oh, going the wrong way. Uh, let me see, because I'm trying to, it should have opened up, but it didn't open up the way that I thought it was going to open up. So it's going to make me do it this way. But like when, like the, uh, open up a new Waffle House, you know, and the GM for Waffle, for this Waffle House, for the region, I talk to him all the time, like via LinkedIn and stuff like that. And that's just the connection is like, wow. And you never know what or who, um, if you're familiar with the brand Carabas, sure. the uh, original owners or founders, they opened up this, um, and this is a shot that I messed up. I'm going to show you where I messed up, right? So they opened up this Mandolas. It's an amazing type thing. It's a fast, casual, Italian type place. So everything's made from scratch. Everything's made there. They have a frozen sangria. But I don't know if you could see it on your screen where I messed up on this shot. The, That's a great answer. I appreciate that. I I don't I don't see it, dude. What's the issue? So for so the the shadow of the modifier, right? Oh because yeah, yeah. I see that. I see it. I see it on the shirt. Ideally, I, I, I noticed I that earlier. Actually, yeah, I see. It. Yeah, I see that. Yeah, ideally, I would have wanted to use a five foot modifier, but when it's windy outside, and I didn't want to go bare bulb because bare bulb wouldn't have gave me the punch that I needed. So, and it wasn't until after, this is another thing, the difference between a DSLR, even though I could have looked on the back, I would have saw this straight through the camera that the shadow of the, sh it was, was falling on them and I would have been able to move it to the side and it came and still lit, lit them good enough. Those are the little things why I say like why the mirrorless side is really good. Um, you know, compared to the DSLR side. Now that's just me. That was my. That was me being stupid. I could blame the gear, but that was just really me, right? But other than that, I love the exposure that I had of them. On and if you can look at the shadows, like like it's, it's that's the, this is really the only angle I could take, and it looks like it's almost like green screen popped in. Did you? So, do it? I mean, it, that's that could be retouched if if it if it matters that much, that can be fixed. So, so shameless plug. So what you're trying to say is that I need to send this uh, image to Pixera to... Uh, no, not just to Pixera, any, any retoucher. I mean, they should be able to fix that if, if, it, if it matters that much. Well, so, so to me, it matters because I want to actually send them a print of this to hang in the, in the, in the uh, actual uh, restaurant. Oh, um, they don't have... They never got this. I got you. Okay. Well, they got the digital print. They got the digital, and they got the through the the um, through the chamber. Yeah. Right? Did they say anything to you, or they didn't even bother? No, they never say. They love it. Every day, like, oh my gosh, this is so beautiful. This is so great. Because right. their eye is not going to be the same as oh, oh man, I messed that up. Right. All right? Things where you know, this, I love this shot right here. So this is Tiki Docks out in Riverview, right? And obviously, you can tell during COVID because everybody has masks on and everything, right? But this is a ribbon cutting. And the one thing I loved is that ribbon cuttings and, and first kisses, 
are pretty much the same thing. You only got one one shot at it. <laughs> and so um, it, it, it's always was great for me to be able to, with the flash, with the light and everything, to always catch that ribbon being cut at the same time. That was, um, it, it was funny because the, the, the Waffle House shot I showed you earlier, the, this was always a big deal for them. And which was not only catching the ribbon being cut, but the confetti. So, so it's an orchestration because this was their whole thing. So it's an orchestration of getting the ribbon, the confetti and everything at the same time. So, you know, but those are things I like doing. I like going out and seeing people, meeting people, taking shots and, you know, um, stupid little good stuff, uh, man. I love these pictures. These are awesome. These are really good. Well, Lane, know, I, I, ahead, um, sorry. we just have like about 35 seconds to go. Okay. If you could just summarize, you know, your last bit of advice for up and coming photographers, anything that you would recommend or, um, you know, just, just some words of wisdom for, for the newbies out there. So the number one thing I would tell any photographer is, first of all, we are all learning, never stop learning. There's always something new to learn from every shoot, everything that you do. None of us knows everything. None of us knows, like we know very little of what we will know 10 years from now. So we're always learning. Uh, the, the next thing I would say is be patient. Be patient, have purpose, know what you want to shoot, know what you're trying to shoot and know where you're trying to go. And, uh, and the last thing, the third thing I would say is study the business, learn the business side. It is better for you to be great in business and an average photographer than to be a great photographer and average in business because you'll be burned out and you won't stay around too long. Thank you. That was a, that was great advice, Layton. I really appreciate it. Well, we, uh, we'll, we'll be in touch and, uh, you know, thanks again for your support and, uh, yeah. Well, th well thank you for having me. We gotta do this more looking, often. Yeah, thank you for having me. If anybody's looking for me, LeightonD.com, L-E-I-G-H-T-O-N-D.com, LeightonD photo um, on Instagram and Twitter and at LeightonD if you really just want to know what I personally think about certain things on Twitter and somewhere around on YouTube too. So there's that, <laughs> right? All right, guys. There you have it. Thanks again, Leighton. No problem. We'll be in touch. Take care.